Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Asia Society Global Online Platform. I'm Tom Nagorski, Executive Vice President of the Asia Society. It's great to have you with us. Um, and I want to start with uh, a mention of the, the issue that has been transfixing us here in the United States anyway and around the world for the last couple of weeks is the American election. And you might wonder why I say that. Well, in part because sometimes in a moment uh, when we are transfixed uh, with other news and other major events, there are significant global events that can go under the radar. Now, here at the Asia Society, uh, we do our best not to let that happen, especially uh, when those events or issues involve Asia. And over the weekend, just a couple of days ago, a major trade deal was signed. 15 nations across Asia joining in uh, something, we'll just give you the acronym, RCEP, RCEP, uh, a major trade deal. And among the implications of it, the United States once again left out, it would appear, as new trade arrangements uh, are put in place across the Asia Pacific. Bilateral trade deals are going to be one way, or maybe one way, the United States gets back in this game of tr global trade. And the bilateral approach has been a priority uh, for the Trump administration. One of the more intriguing possibilities in play at the moment is the subject of today's program. As it says in our program announcement, a U.S.-Taiwan bilateral trade agreement, or BTA, may be, quote, inching closer to reality, unquote. Driven in part by Taiwan's leader, President Tsai Ing-wen, and also a rare piece of bipartisanship here in the United States. Most of you will know, our viewers uh, uh, tend to be sophisticated about such things. One of the few things that Democrats and Republicans in the United States can agree on these days is a tough stance against China. And one element of that is the possibility of a closer relationship with Taiwan. Just last month, 50 U.S. senators, both sides of the political divide, signed a letter urging the United States Trade Representative Bob Lighthizer to begin formal negotiations for a U.S.-Taiwan bilateral trade agreement. And later this week, U.S. and Taiwanese officials are to meet to work on economic issues uh, and initiatives. So we're going to dive into all of this today with a great group of speakers. Uh, as always, just a couple of quick notes before we get started about uh, coming events or actually ongoing events this week on the Asia Society calendar. All this week, we're hosting events in conjunction with our 11th annual U.S. Asia Entertainment Summit. This is run by our Southern California Center. It's typically a big uh, gathering of uh, media and entertainment professionals from the United States and Asia uh, that we hold in Hollywood. Um, but like most events and just about everything at the moment, it's all virtual now. If you go to asiasociety.org, we have events, as I said, throughout the week um, in conjunction with the Entertainment Summit. And for friends in the New York area, we do have an in-person pitch to make. Do please come uh, for a free and safe an in-person visit to the Asia Society Museum uh, and Galleries and our landmark Asia Society Triennial of Contemporary Asian Art. This is the first of its kind, uh, critically acclaimed. It's spectacular. It's beautiful. And again, you need only register. We are uh, in the uh, uh, aim of public health and safety. Uh, we are keeping uh, uh, visits uh, well um, controlled and contained, uh, but it is a great show. And again, you can go to asiasociety.org to register uh, for a triennial visit or to just see all the latest on our global online platform. Okay, now to today's program. And to get us started, we are delighted to have with us the Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office here in New York. That would be Director General James Lee. He is a career diplomat, served Taiwan for more than 30 years, including most recently as Secretary General of Taiwan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Deputy Representative uh, to the United Nations. Uh, James will set the stage for us with some opening remarks, and then uh, we will bring in the group for our discussion. But James Lee, thank you again for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Tom, uh, for your introduction, and thank you, Asia Society, for making this event possible. Uh, ASPI Vice President uh, Cutler, uh, U.S. Taiwan Business Council President Hamilton Chamber, uh, Dr. Roy Lee, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, we are glad to have this opportunity uh, to jointly present the prospect of the U.S. Taiwan bilateral trade agreement with the Asia Society. And thank you for inviting me to set the stage 
for our discussion today. Today's event cannot be more timely. Two days from now, uh, on the 20th, Under Secretary of State Keith Scratchy uh, will lead the Economic Prosperity Partnership Dialogue with Taiwan. This will be an important step toward an even broader economic cooperation between our two countries. And it is also show that the United States recognize Taiwan as a reliable and vital partner in the Indo-Pacific region. This partnership is crucial as we face an unprecedented public health crisis, which has exposed not just health challenge, but for many of us, uh, the fragility of our global supply chain today. I would like to use this as an opener to stress the deeper cooperation or even a bilateral trade agreement is not just about trade. It is also about security. Taiwan and the U.S. has long been uh, strong partners. Both are democracy committed to the rule of law and free markets. Our close trade relations can be seen from the fact that the U.S. has been uh, Taiwan's second largest trading partner for many years. And in the first three quarters of the 2020, Taiwan became the U.S. ninth largest trading partner, surpassing France and India in total trade volume and in exports. In terms of agricultural trade, Taiwan is the United States' seventh largest agricultural export market ahead of uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, and India. Two-way investment flows have also been strong. Taiwan is the 15th largest foreign investor into the United States, while the U.S. has long been Taiwan's second largest source of foreign direct investment. Google, IBM, and Microsoft have expanded their investment in Taiwan over the past few years. In fact, uh, just last month, Microsoft announced a major investment project uh, to build its first regional cloud data center in Taiwan. Here in the United States, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing uh, Company also announced uh, plans to build a state-of-art uh, production facility in Arizona, and other downstream companies are expected to follow uh, the semiconductor giant uh, to establish an industrial cluster nearby. Building on this substantive and robust economic tie, a BTA would help further enhance U.S.-Taiwan relations on many levels. Strategically, uh, as a beacon of democracy in the Western Pacific and a key link in the first island chain, Taiwan is a reliable and vital partner for the U.S. in the Indo-Pacific region. As President-elect Biden's foreign policy advisor, uh, Anthony Blinken put it, stronger economic tie with Taiwan support our shared democratic values and our common commitment to regional peace and stability, quote unquote. At a time uh, when Taiwan has been left out of the ASEP and the uh, CPTPP, a U.S.-Taiwan PTA is crucial to ensure Taiwan's democratic future and will demonstrate the U.S. commitment to regional security. Economically, a BTA will further enhance economic integration and create jobs, investments for the United States. In the face of a U.S.-China uh, tariff war and global supply chain restructuring, many Taiwanese technology companies uh, have sold manufacturing base outside of China. As the, this exodus train continue, the U.S. has become one of their uh, more favorable destinations. A BTA could draw 
uh, Taiwan's high-tech company in the field of uh, semiconductor, uh, biomedical supply, AI, and Internet of Things to the U.S. and help secure its vital supply chain. It could also uh, serve as a template for other Asian countries when negotiating BTAs uh, with the United States. Uh, Taiwan has long been committed to deepening its economic tie with the U.S. Uh, by seeking to sign a fair, reciprocal, and high standard BTA. We have also worked to resolve outstanding issues. Uh, the past summer, our government announced the easing of restriction uh, on the U.S. pork and beef import. Uh, this has long been a contentious issue in Taiwan, yet uh, the very move show the government, the administration's strong determination and political leadership to overcome barriers. And we are glad that our effort uh, are being recognized as 50 Democrats and Republican U.S. Senator signed a letter uh, last month to U.S. Trade Representative uh, Robert Lighthizer, uh, urging him to begin uh, BTA negotiation with Taiwan. As we move over future trade relations, the U.S. and Taiwan have a lot to uh, complement and benefit each other. In addition to the supply chain I just mentioned, there are indeed many areas we could uh, increase cooperation, uh, be it health, energy, uh, digital trade, uh, clean 5G network, and IPR protections. Economic and security interests are intertwined. Taiwan cannot allow itself to be over dependent economically on a menacing China. So we must create uh, other avenues. For Washington, it is important to have a free and democratic partner in Asia especially the one uh, that has been guarding the front line of democracy. We shall work together to explore all possible means and find the best roadmap to achieve the goal. So this should be the, in the interest of our two countries and all like-minded uh, partners. With this, I hope I have laid the groundwork and look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Director General James Lee. We really appreciate it. And you have uh, laid the groundwork uh, for the discussion. Uh, so thank you for that. And thank you for your time. And, and now if we can bring in uh, our panelists for this discussion. Uh, joining us today, Rupert Hammond, Ch Hammond Chambers from Bethesda, Maryland this morning, president of the U.S. Taiwan Business Council, a membership-based association that supports investment trade and commerce between the United States and Taiwan. He's also managing director for Taiwan at Bauer Group Asia and responsible uh, for that group's defense and security practice. Uh, in the strange way that the uh, global online platform works, uh, also in Bethesda this morning, Wendy Cutler, vice president of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Uh, visitors to our programs will know her well. Uh, managing director of our Washington DC office also, and before that nearly three decades, as a diplomat and negotiator in the office of the U.S. Trade Representative. So, of course, she brings a lot of relevant background to this conversation. Most recently, when he served as acting deputy U.S. Trade Representative and worked on a range of uh, U.S. trade negotiations and initiatives in the Asia Pacific, including uh, most prominently a major role in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, uh, including the bilateral negotiations with Japan that led to that treaty, she was also chief negotiator to the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement and happy to have with us nowhere near Bethesda, but in Taipei, uh, where it is late. So thank you so much to Roy Chun Lee for joining us. He is associate research fellow and deputy director of the Taiwan World Trade Organization and Regional Trade Agreement Center at the Chunghua Institution for Economic Research. Uh, Roy is a policy advisor for Taiwan's trade negotiations with China, New Zealand and Singapore and a member of the Advisory Committee on E-Commerce 
of the Taiwan Coalition of Service Industries. So great to have you all with us. Quick word to our audience, as always, uh, you may use the chat and comment functions, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, where we stream these events. If you have questions, always a better program if there are fewer questions from me and more from our smart folks watching around the world. Um, but just to get started here, uh, as Director General Lee said a couple of times, there are not just trade and economic questions in play here. Uh, there are also security uh, issues. And um, uh, that is true uh, whenever the United States and Taiwan are part of a conversation. Uh, certainly from the United States standpoint, and I want to begin, if I can, then with, with you, Wendy Cutler, uh, there is this question, uh, is the impetus or momentum at the moment for a bilateral trade agreement with, uh, with Taiwan, do you think it's being put forward primarily as a matter of trade policy? Or is it being seen in Washington as one more way uh, to go after Beijing, to put it bluntly? Um, well, thanks. Those are really key questions. I would really just like to commend Director General Lee for providing such a compelling case on why the United States <clears throat> should go forward with a BTA with Taiwan. Um, I would just remind our speakers that this is not a new idea um, I worked at USTR for many years, and um, for some of those years, I was responsible for U.S.-Taiwan economic relations. And this proposal was raised and discussed a number of times, um, but we concluded that the time wasn't right yet. So why now? What's going on here? And I really think there are three factors in play. The first is um, from the trade side. Taiwan has recently lifted restrictions on pork imports from the United States, as well as beef um, imports from the United States. And why is this so important? Because believe it or not, these two trade restrictions really stood in the way um, on, and, uh, of moving forward and strengthening our economic relationship. Um, and I think they also demonstrated that, that the Taiwan leadership is willing to take kind of bold political decisions that need to be made if you're going to enter into a trade negotiation. But second, let's just put this on the table too. There's a lot going on um, in the geostrategic world. Um, we are trying the United States to reduce our reliance on the mainland. Um, we are supporting democracies and, you know, Taiwan democracy favoring, as D.G. Lee said, rule of law, good governance, etc. cetera. Um, there are a lot of compelling reasons for us to be working together and strengthening our overall relationship. And third, I think there is a bit of an urgency here, at least from the um, Taiwan perspective, and I'm not sure... Um, how valid it is, and that is, I think they they have concluded that there may be a window here to try and at least secure an announcement by the current Trump administration of the launch of a BTA um, with the United States, um, harboring some doubt that the president elect, um, you know, would continue on this course, and we can we can discuss that more. But again, kind of three factors in play, and they're all kind of reaching head at the same time. So uh, I was going to wait a little bit before coming back to uh, the American election, but maybe we should just pick up where, where Wendy left off. And, and let's go, uh, Roy, to you in, uh, in Taipei for that last point about the change in administrations here. Um, now, as I said in the introduction, uh, there is bipartisan uh, uh, support, I think, for both a tougher line in, in many of the respects, as Wendy said, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, mainland China, uh, and therefore also uh, outreach to Taiwan. But it's no secret that Secretary Pompeo and the Trump administration generally have really been, um, you know, forceful proponents uh, of this uh, closer relationship with Taipei. Uh, so so how, how much truth do you think there is in a little bit of a a rush to at least get this thing kick-started before we come to the inauguration and a Biden administration. Um, is there concern there that this just may, at minimum, go to the back burner of concerns for a new president who's got a hundred other things to worry about? Any thoughts on that, Roy? 
Well, um, absolutely. Uh, in terms of the concern, uh, Tom, you just raised uh, over the last uh, week or so when uh, uh, President Biden's uh, uh, confirmation as the president-elect is becoming uh, clear over time. I think, uh, especially within the trade circle here, uh, start to discuss the possibility that uh, despite the fact that BTA topic will remain uh, alive, but the time frame of uh, you know kickstart uh, 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 negotiation, I mean interim negotiation more will be uh, delayed. Uh, President Biden has in different places expressed his reservations about uh, trade agreements. Right, he once said that he. He will not rush into any agreement when he 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 thinks the U.S., uh, the United States, the Americans are not uh, fully ready for the global uh, competition. Uh, we read those lines as a kind of you know traditional approach of having uh, you know looking at the uh, workers in America first. Now, uh, uh, as as Wendy mentioned, the BTA between U.S. and Taiwan is not a new. Uh, idea. Uh, I have a personal experience as well on this. Uh, my first research assignment when returning from Australia, Australia back in 2006 is indeed the feasibility study of a BTA with the U.S. <laughs> it has been. Do you, uh, do you still have that? Do you still have that paper? We should. Uh... Of course, of course. <laughs> but many of the arguments are still valid. I mean, the data need to be updated. Yeah. Uh, it's been 14 years, so uh, you know it, it has been up and down. And personally, I would like to see uh, the idea become a reality. But uh, the Trump, President Trump, did give us uh, a, a assignment. And you know, before the election, as you read from the newspaper, Taiwan is one of the places outside the U.S. who has the strongest support for President Trump. Right. Uh, and, and people support for for President Trump because of this possibility and, and excitement. But uh, anyhow, in reality, we are facing uh, possible Biden, um, I mean, more, most likely a Biden uh, administration now. But I think that there's the economic, I mean, the economic case or the economic argument to support a U.S.-Taiwan uh, BTA will uh, increase over time. As uh, DG Lee just mentioned, uh, uh, last year, t- the year 2019, the United States once again became became Taiwan's second largest export market. You know, the last time uh, U.S. was our second largest market is about 35 years ago. So there is a, a, a lot of evidence demonstrating that because of the supply chain restructuring, because of this uh, the trade war and the, you know the U.S. China broader economic rivalry, the global supply chain, especially the traditional, you know, U.S. Taiwan China triangle has been kind of uh, reconfigurating over the last two years, and direct trade and investment ac- uh, activity between U.S. and China is is uh, is is on the rise in a, in a kind of dramatic scale. And secondly, uh, President Trump as well as B- President Biden are all promoting this idea of rebuilding the U.S. supply chain, and I think Taiwan is definitely one of the a uh, trusted uh, partner to facilitate uh, this process, high tech or not. So I think over time, even though uh, policy-wise, maybe President Biden is not really favoring having any agreement, but I think the economic case, the econo- uh, economic uh, foundation to support the, few, the prospect of uh, BTA between US and Taiwan is actually on the rise. So that's a great segue to come to back to Bethesda to uh, to Rupert Hammond Chambers, if we can. I mean, you you uh, much of your work, uh, if I understand it correctly, is to to make that economic case that Roy was just uh, was just referencing. But I, I'd be curious to know your answer to two questions. Um, first, the original one I asked about how concerned you are about a little slip back in enthusiasm, at least uh, when the the new administration uh, takes office for this. And also, it's probably a fundamental question, but why is it 14 years since Roy Lee wrote his excellent paper, you know, proposing this and and we're still where we are? Oh, thank you, Tom. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, on, on the first, I, th- I think it's 
Um, because the, 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 the process and progress in U.S.-Taiwan relations isn't linear, um, I think it's, it's important to sort of look back um, all the way perhaps to the Clinton administration to see the sort of um, progress, the stops and starts, if you will, in how the United States views its national interest in, in its relationship with Taiwan and how that's been impacted by our relationship with the Chinese, um, a relationship with China that um, uh, some argued at the time was blossoming as China ascended to the WTO. But what we saw ev emerge in the U.S.-Taiwan relationship is a, is, a, a, is a U.S. interest with Taiwan that regrettably um, was often marginalized um, with a false choice, uh, the, 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 that false choice being that you couldn't have a relationship with the Chinese and with Taiwan um, that made forward progress. And therefore, it was important to recognize what the more important relationship was and focus in on that and to marginalize the less important relationship. And we, we had a really tricky time in, in the second term of the Bush administration and, and through uh, uh, the second term of the Obama administration on, on the back of that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I think um, because we've seen a surge in the relationship with under Mr. Trump um, uh, broadly, um, some have argued that he he and his his uh, colleagues do it because they're poking China. Um, that's not our experience in the Thai, U.S. Taiwan business community. Um, we see a, a relationship that is burgeoned based on a, sh a fundamental shift in the way in which America views its national interest in relation to the island broadly um, through uh, Taiwan's democracy. And of course, that the greater urgency now that Hong Kong has, has, has uh, experienced such a dramatic downturn in its political fortunes and the heavy hand of China. Um, Security-wise, as China has, has increasingly emerged as a hegemonic security power in the Asia-Pacific region, what that means for us, for the Japanese, for the Aussies and others, and, um, and also in trade. Um, Mr. Trump, uh, to his credit, I think, in uh, 2015 and 2016, as he, as he ramped up in his election campaign, talked about China in a way in which the China consensus, not directed at one side or the other politically here, um, I, I think both sides were guilty of this in, in our view, certainly, um, uh, um, talked about China in a, in a, in a deeply negative and, and concerning way um, and, and hit many key um, aspects of that relationship that I think a lot of Americans agreed with. And not surprisingly, I think we see now a, a, a consensus, um, certainly that China is a challenge, um, although Mr. Biden, and Mr. Trump, um, certainly through the prism I, I, I consume, have quite different views about what to prioritize with the Chinese and how to pursue it. Um, but <clears throat> economically, certainly Taiwan um, is hugely important and only getting more so. Uh, particularly in the supply chain with its systems integrators and in the tech space. <clears throat> and I'm very happy to see a much greater understanding and increasingly so, particularly the importance of the semiconductor community, why Taiwan is so important in its relationship with the United States from a strategic standpoint, as well as a commercial standpoint, the way in which those two interrelate. Why has it taken 14 years? Well, I, I, I think I've sort of answered that through... Yeah. Through the through the uh, through 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 my explanation there, um, just a, a wee word on the on the BTA front, um, and to Wendy's point because I, I I love to listen to Wendy talk because she's she's got so much experience in in the history of all of this. Um, you know, go, going back to sort of the oh three oh four oh five time frame when um uh, we had people like Charles Freeman um at USDR as, as well, and and um there was real discussion about uh, the possibility of an FDA. We called it then. Um, and uh, it, um, it didn't quite work out at that juncture. Um, and then things drifted away. And it, it, it's why I think there's so much, um, there's some anxiety, but also some pressure and some real momentum right now to see if this is a moment that we can capture um, uh, for this BTA because it's so hard to get over the finish line. Right. right. Well, well said. said. And, and thank, thank you. you. Um, let me come to back to Wendy for... A question about a phrase, and I don't even know how in vogue it is anymore in the uh, in the think tank circles or elsewhere, which is strategic ambiguity, right? And uh, for a long time, that has been those two words have come to define certain elements. I think more on the security than the than the economic relationship between the United States and and, and Taiwan. Meaning, basically, uh, when it comes to uh, the delicate dance with 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 China, 
uh, that uh, there was amb ambiguity about how the United States would respond to certain threats, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I, the phrase comes to mind as, as you've all been talking, because again, it is such a, there has been such a delicate dance that the United States does. And I guess, Wendy, I'd ask you, to what extent, even just from a trade standpoint, I mean, we've had these, these you know, slogs to get to just the phase one deal uh, between the United States and China. Um, what, what is uh, at risk or at stake in your view, if anything, as we inch forward, uh, if we do uh, on a bilateral trade deal with Taiwan, uh, with the mainland? And I know you're not a, uh, uh, you know, you're not a geosecurity expert, but I mean, What's the risk here that Americans should have in mind? Mm -hmm. Well, before I, before I get to that, maybe I can just make a few points in response to what Rupert and um, Dr. Lee said. And that is that um, there is a consensus in the United States and among all the administrations I work with that we need to strengthen our economic relations with mm -hmm. Taiwan. It's in our interest. It's in Taiwan's interest. It's a no brainer. But the real question then is, do you take that leap into a comprehensive trade negotiation? And I would just remind everyone, negotiations of comprehensive trade deals are extremely difficult. They're very time consuming. Um, they take a lot of resources. And even if um, under the Trump administration over the next 64 days, there was some kind of announcement to launch negotiations, um, these things would not be concluded quickly. Um, Taiwan has made a lot of progress in addressing U.S. concerns with respect to intellectual property protection, pharmaceutical issues, medical device issues, transparency, and agriculture. But they still have a far way to go. And I would just, you know, put on the table that this would not be an easy negotiation. No FTA or BTA negotiation is easy, no matter how overlapping kind of the political or foreign policy interests are between um, the, the two economies. Now, um, with respect to the question you asked, um, and here I would, you know, just kind of put on the table, I think what's going on in the administration right now is once Taiwan lifted these meat restrictions, which once again was a very important milestone um, in this saga, um, then the, the Trump administration was kind of confronted with, well, how do we respond to Taiwan's desire to launch PTA negotiations? I think the State Department very much was advocating, let's go forward and do this. Well, I think USTR had um, some reservations. I don't know this for a fact, but uh, if I were sitting in the Winder building right now and I was working also on the phase one agreement with China, for example, and it's the lead up to the election, I would be kind of nervous that China could respond by maybe slowing down their purchases of agriculture and other products under the agreement or finding kind of other ways to harass US companies, um, or frankly, take measures or say things in, in, in non-trade areas. So I, th I think there are risks, and I think in, in going forward with Taiwan, if a decision were taken, I think all those risks really need to be closely evaluated to see how real they are and whether they're risks to be taken. So for the non-trade uh, negotiators and non-business people among us, i.e. me, and perhaps some of our audience, like Wendy, just to follow up. So if, if your take is, well, don't forget how hard this is. Don't forget how wrenching it might be. Don't forget how many concessions might have to be made. But your earlier point was it's a no-brainer, right, for the U.S. and Taiwan to come. So, so what, what would be the alternative, in your view, uh, you know, is there just a suite of, of closer U.S.-Taiwan business ties that uh, might make uh, Rupert and, and, uh, and others at Bowers happy, but, but short of a, an agreement? Is that what you're suggesting or, or what exactly? Yeah, so what I'm suggesting is perhaps, you know, we start um, with a narrower negotiation, perhaps on supply chains, perhaps on digital trade. In fact, D.G. Lee, I was writing down the, the list of issues that he mentioned for economic cooperation, including supply chains. He said health, energy, digital trade, IPR protection. 
I mean, you, we could go forward in one or a number of these areas, work with Taiwan, and it wouldn't even have to stop there. So I'm a big advocate um, of doing a regional digital trade ag agreement um, with other Asian partners. And frankly, you know, why couldn't Taiwan be um, a member of such, um, you know, of such a negotiation given our overlapping interests there? So for me, um, I think not only with respect to our relationship with Taiwan, um, but also where we are on trade more broadly. And um, I think Dr. Lee mentioned this, that the Biden administration has made it clear that they're not interested in jumping into new trade negotiations until they um, have done their domestic work, including COVID recovery, economic recovery, and investing in America. So I don't think there's going to be a great appetite with anyone to do kind of these mega comprehensive trade deals. So that said, I think it's important for the United States to strengthen ties with Taiwan and frankly, to step up our engagement on trade in the Asia Pacific. And as you mentioned, with RCEP being concluded now this weekend, I think the case for us really stepping up our, our participation, engagement and leadership on trade is, 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 is critical. So, you know, let's figure out how Taiwan fits in um, that rubric. So I'd love to get Roy and Rupert's response to that, just we have other questions coming in. Um, but before we go to the audience questions, Roy, what, what would you say then? I mean, in a way, Wendy's poured a little bit of cold yeah. water on, uh, on, on the process. For, but uh, well, yeah, your, your yeah, reaction to that. any of what she just uh, ran through? Okay, first of all, there are several other options. First of all, it's the CPTPP. Right? People talk about the returning of the U.S. to the original TPP or joining the new CPTPP, bringing uh, with the U.S., uh, Taiwan and South Korea, for example. So that's one other pos another possibility of uh, uh, not so much a bilateral agreement, but you know, still a U.S.-Taiwan trade relationship and under the auspices of a of a larger regional integration undertaking, right? But uh, you know, but the idea for me is really we are always pushing here in tai Taiwan to let's negotiate something. Even the digital trade is good. The reason being, most of these uh, negotiation opportunities for Taiwan, from our perspective, is actually the the the, the impetus for the government to continue its dom domestic regulatory reform. You know, we have studied the CPTV chapters on digital trade, on transparency, on SOEs, for example, and we made recommendations that you have to do this and that in order to get ready. Well, they, most of the governments say, okay, they understand, but, but there's no urgency, so let's do that tomorrow, right? So negotiation is not really about, only about trade concession. I mean, tariff concession is not really, uh, well, it's still important, but it's not the centerpiece between US and Taiwan because the average tariff is already very low. Well, of course, for Taiwan, there's an agriculture tariff uh, issue. But for us, uh, we, we are seeing the negotiation opportunity as a way to, to kind of import pressure to accelerate the domestic reform, which we are lacking for the last two decades. You know, we're not a member of the OECD, for example. We don't have peer review pressure. We are not uh, entering any, you know, uh, modern 21st century FTA with any country. So there's a lack of momentum lack of external impetus for domestic reform. So that's, so I 100% I support when this idea of this building block approach, you know, even the digital trade is a good thing. You know, let Taiwan to review our regimes on data protection and data transfer. So we have a lot of uh, reviews, but never, you know, uh, facing, I mean, transporting uh, those reviews into a, a re real reform uh, agenda. So that's a, one of the value of a, of a BTA, bilateral or under the CBT with the United States. So, and the, sorry, the last point is, you know, I think the economic, uh, our recommendation, recent recommendation for the Taiwan government is also to focus on partnership in the supply chain reform. Because that's, to our view, the next gener kind of next generation regional integration process. So next generation integration uh, or supply chain partner look at the quality of 
security, the qualification of, you know, uh, a, a like-minded or, 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 or trusted partnership, in addition to tariff and the agreement. So let's focus on those things that Taiwan can demonstrate and capture now and, you know, worry about BTA later. Okay, that's what, uh, Rupert. Anything to add to that? Coming back. To- oh, I, I just just quickly. I, I I'd love to just jump in. Um, I I really like a, a point that Wendy made about the consideration that the USDR undertakes when it thinks about China, the mother of all commercial relationships for us. It's highly political, and obviously, um, the the economic dynamic as well cannot just simply cannot be ignored. Um. <clears throat> but to, to be a wee bit controversial here, um, I, 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 I would point out that um, what tends to happen, USDR hasn't held a TIFA, a trade and investment framework agreement with Taiwan since 2016. So even in an ultra permissive environment under the Trump administration with Taiwan, we are still from a, an economic engagement standpoint, really taking the lowest economic denominator for trade engagement through a period in which one would ho- would have hoped that we could have made real progress. And to me, part of the, 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 the biggest reason is, is that USTR continues to make the false choice between China and Taiwan, that there's, there is too much of that still in consideration. If you look at what other departments have done during the Trump administration to try and mitigate some of that internal um, uh, 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 self-negotiation, negotiating with ourselves, the, uh, the Defense Department and the Commerce Department actually split responsibility for China and Taiwan away from the same person internally to try and give each area more consideration within their departments as opposed to having the same person responsible for both. Because China is so important, Taiwan invariably became a subset of that consideration as opposed to being mm-hmm. considered on the merits itself. And that, that, that's been a real problem. Um, and it, it's not a mistake that the economic dialogue that will be held on Friday is taking place. This is partly a response of the internal frustration within the Trump administration amongst departments over an unwillingness on the part of USTR to engage Taiwan economically um, through even through the legacy platform, the very modest legacy platforms that we've had. And so what we've seen here is state in this instance leverage its um, a right to hold economic dialogues, and that's <clears throat> that's popping out as a, 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 a partly, and I think actually quite considerably over frustrations over an unwillingness on the part of USDR to do it. And I, 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 I we're very frustrated with USDR um, when we hear issues like we don't have the resources and the bandwidth and so on, because if if they don't, um, there there are two courses of action as far as we're concerned. One, go to the Congress and ask for more because it's prohibiting you from doing your job, or if you feel that there's a, there's, an, there's, a, there's a fundamental contradiction in your ability to do your work on China and work on Taiwan, then perhaps that's an interagency conversation over putting Taiwan somewhere else where that, where that negotiation and where that relationship can be appropriately managed separate of China considerations. Hmm. That's a really good point. I see Wendy smiling, but do you want to add anything from your past USTR time or, or we go to audience questions? Well, I, I will say that I think it was in 2015, the year I left, that I did chair a TIFA meeting with um, with Taiwan. So um, I didn't realize that the subsequent meetings it, it all haven't fell been apart held after since you 2016. Left, Wendy. Yeah. No, but when I hear Rupert right now, I'm glad I'm not the one who's, you know, who is to make these decisions because they are tough. But again, I would just, you know, I think what everyone needs to remember is that USTR doesn't make decisions lightly about entering into these type of negotiations with partners. And even this administration, which is focused on, you know, if you if you read what they said the first year, we're going to be launching bilateral negotiations with economies all over the world. If you look at what they've actually achieved, it's pretty modest because each negotiation, you know, takes a lot of work and a lot of resources. So right now, there are really only two FTA negotiations underway, one with Kenya and one with the UK. And frankly, with USMCA and Korea and Japan, they were either partial deals or or just updating, um, you know, an old deal. So again, I think that just demonstrates 
um, you know, the work involved. And I, I hear what Rupert's saying, but again, as someone who sat at the table, and, you know, let me just remind everyone, Taiwan's come a long way in terms of opening and reforming its market. But I think even Dr. Lee was, was, was um, indicating that, you know, Taiwan could, could benefit from external pressure to proceed with more reforms and opening. So there's, there is more, um, a lot more, I think, that Taiwan would need to do in order to conclude a comprehensive trade deal with the United States. Um, which means that this isn't something that would be negotiated in a matter of months. I, I, yeah. Based on my experience, that, that wouldn't happen. So uh, let's go to audience questions. And you've just uh, uh, referenced old deals, uh, Wendy. Um, I'm just marrying a couple of questions together here, and they're, they're for you, uh, Wendy Cutler. Uh, from YouTube, Bill Armbruster asks, why was Taiwan not included in the original TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and then a, another one from another viewer, uh, would there be room, you've written, Wendy, about some sort of potential U.S. return to the TPP um, without getting too much into that. Would there be room for Taiwan in, a, uh, um, in some kind of new regional trade agreement? And would a U.S.-Taiwan bilateral deal help or hurt the chances? So first, why, were, why was Taiwan not in the TPP? And, and, and than the future question. Yep. Okay, so with respect to that, again, the United States, we didn't invite countries to join the TPP negotiations. Right. Countries indicated their interest and then had to demonstrate to the other members that they were ready to take on these high standard commitments. And I personally spent like two years with Japan in pre-TPP negotiations before the United States could offer support for Japan to join. And at that point, um, let's just keep in mind that Taiwan had many more restrictions in place than it has now. Um, you know, in those days, even its IPR regime, um, you know, presented major challenges for um, for the U.S. and other countries. So um, that's number one. Um, number two, I would say we're not a member of CPTPP now. So nothing stopping Taiwan from now to work with the other <laughs> excuse me, CPTPP members to get into the CPTPP. But, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't, again, under a Biden administration, I don't see us entering CPTPP for a while. So I'm not sure the question's really germane right now. Right. Let's let Wendy clear her throat and get some water. Uh, uh, Roy, I guess, well, this could be a question for Roy or for uh, for Rupert, but uh, to what extent, I think, Roy, you and the Director General both reference what's going on in Hong Kong. So here's a question. Given what's happening in Hong Kong, and at least for the remainder of the Trump administration, should it be expected that along with some others in the region, i.e. Singapore, uh, will Taiwan also be a beneficiary from the fallout from Hong Kong? Does that give a stronger push for such a trade deal? How much is Hong Kong a, an issue here for, for all of this? Well, I, th I think that uh, Taiwan's ability to capture some of the uh, benefits of uh, what happened in Hong Kong is, I have to say, limited. Uh, first of all, try, uh, Hong Kong uh, benefits, uh, I mean, Hong Kong's qualification as a great way to China is not uh, replaceable by Taiwan, given the fact that we, ha we are currently having so many restrictions on uh, investment trade between Taiwan and China. It is unlikely, uh, if not impossible, for Taiwan to serve uh, as a gateway to China anymore. Especially in the financial sector, we are not able to provide uh, even part of the function that Hong Kong is uh, providing as a financial uh, uh, hub or gateway uh, center for, for uh, foreign companies operating in China. So that's uh, one of the reasons uh, we don't think uh, Taiwan is able to capture, I mean, to uh, to able to uh, capture some of the uh, uh, um, interest or investment that is leaving Hong Kong. And also, uh, Hong Kong is also serving as a kind of logistics center for products entering and leaving uh, China. And for that, again, Taiwan is not really uh, uh, qualified to serve that role as well. One that said, I think there are areas where Taiwan is able to uh, take advantage of this progress. First of all, uh, in the professional services sector, especially education, 
we we have already seen some of the uh, 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 lectures professors in Hong Kong University uh, trying to uh, I mean at, at least exploring the possibility of moving to Taiwan, especially in the social science areas. And also, we are also uh, seeing many of the uh, uh, professionals from the entertaining sector are uh, mm -hmm. considering moving to Taiwan. So uh, we are not going to replace Hong Kong in those major roles, but I think there will be some subtle but equally important uh, areas where Taiwan will be able to uh, uh, you know, attract some of the talents to Taiwan. Now we have a question for that that is again addressed to all panelists, but I think is a is a Rupert question if ever there was one, uh, which is specifically uh, what what kinds of uh, numbers are you seeing in terms of potential job creation if there were to be a bilateral trade agreement? Uh, I, I assume the, the viewer means U.S. job creation as a result, and we know. I mean, in a way. Um, You've all mentioned, Wendy, especially, uh, you know, we, we live in a time when trade arrangements uh, uh, have been, uh, we know what Donald Trump did to the TPP. It's not, as Wendy said, necessarily uh, top of mind for the Biden administration. So a great counter argument, at least in this country, would be to say, aha, uh -huh, we move forward for this with this and it will bring X number of jobs in these sectors uh, uh, to the economy. That stuff people can understand viscerally, but have you crunched some numbers like that, Rupert? Uh. Uh, Tom, candidly, as far as I'm aware, the last uh, deep dive into the impact that produced data mm -hmm. was done in 0304 by the Peterson Institute by Nick Lardy and Dan Rosen. Yeah. Uh, so we're really, we do not have any current data based on the economic relationship between the two right now on on what that might look like, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, you know, I, I'd love to come up with some wonderful numbers for you, but uh, frankly, right now, any data sitting out there is 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 dated. Um, I also understand that um, there is some research going on in Taiwan at the moment with several of the large um, um, uh, economic uh, uh, think tanks. Uh, taking a hard look at, at uh, um, what an updated BTA would look like, and I'm certainly looking forward to seeing some of that data flow. Um, but mm -hmm. no, I'm afraid I, I, I don't have a good answer for you on that front. So uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. My center is undertaking the research that Rupert just mentioned. Got it. But I have to say the outcome is still under embargo, so I cannot really <laughs> share it at this moment. But well, maybe a later we, 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 will, we will watch for it. Um, Wendy Cutler, let's give you the last word here. And I asked you this in another context we, when we did an event not long ago when uh, – uh, Vice President Biden became president-elect Biden. Seems like 100 years ago. I think it's only 10 days or so. But uh, so, so there you are. Let's say you are the new U.S. trade representative. And so you are in the Oval Office or someplace else, and you're advising uh, President Biden on, uh, uh, on, on trade generally and deals to pursue. Where would a bilateral trade agreement with Taiwan come into that conversation? What would you uh, advocate in that regard? Um, I would advocate um, the need and the mutual interest in strengthening bilateral economic relations with Taiwan. I would underscore our commonalities with respect to democracy, values, um, governance. And then I would recommend that we proceed with a deal in, 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 in one or two issue areas to be determined, you know, based on consultations with Taiwan. And then in the meantime, to leave the door open for something more robust and comprehensive um, should the Biden administration and should, should um, his, you know, his team consider um, entering into trade negotiations once they've adequately um, dealt with domestic issues that they've put on the radar screen. All right. How does we're that gonna, sound? <laughs> yeah, no, we're going to, I put you on the spot. I apologize, but um, we're going to need to leave it there. Um, I, I really want to thank uh, Roy Lee, uh, Rupert Hammond Chambers, Wendy Cutler, Director General James Lee for the introductory remarks. It's a super interesting conversation. Uh, my learning curve is, is steep and it's, uh, it's been helped. 
Uh, so thank you all. And thanks to our viewers uh, and listeners uh, around the world, uh, wherever you may be, uh, stay with us uh, uh, by looking at asiasociety.org. Stay safe and have a great day or a great evening. Thank you all.